The title of the message today is simply this, start again, start again. Who feels like they need to start again in an area of their life? I'm right there, right now, I can tell you. What I want to do, I want to go straight to the book of John. I love the book of John. I want to meet this man. He's like the love bandit, this guy, John. He's, he's, the, he's the man that wrote about love. And so we're going to go to John chapter 2, and we're going to begin at verse 1. We're going to go all the way through to verse 10. Are you ready, church? Good. Awesome. You're going to love this story. This is the story of the wedding. And many of you will have heard this story before. For some of you, it may be the very first time. But I want to tell you that it's a powerful story. Let the words jump off the page and into your heart today. It's going to make a difference. It says this, The next day there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. And Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities. And so Jesus' mother told him, they have no more wine. Dear woman, that's not our problem, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. And when the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. And when the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, although, of course, the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine. But you have kept the best until now. I'm about to show you something that's been very dear to me for many years. It'll come up on the screen in a moment. Now, some of you brothers will be be literally drooling right now. That was my 1969... Mac 1 Mustang. Now, I'm sure you would agree that it looks tough. Yeah, it looks classic. But it had a dodgy fuel gauge. You can see, if you look closely, you'll see that that car is on the back of a, of a tow truck. It just seemed to spend most of its life on the back of a tow truck. Ask my wife. But this car, because it had a dodgy fuel gauge, I, what happened was that I ran out of fuel on more occasions than I would have liked to and ended up having lots of long walks to a service station with a jerry can in my hand. And eventually that car and I would part company and end our 11-year relationship together. We are no longer more in relationship, but that's okay. But emptiness, running out of anything, is actually quite a distressing thing, isn't it? When you run out of something. And we see in this story of the wedding that they... They ran out of something that you should never run out of at a wedding at that time, and that is wine. I reckon this, the, the stress would have been intense. There would have been major embarrassment, great shame, and, and possible loss of reputation. You know, I can imagine that you know, maybe years after, they'd be talking in the village, hey, you remember that wedding where they ran out of wine? I mean, this is not what you wanted happening you know, at one of the biggest ceremonies that you would ever put on in your life. But this story, it highlights something very real for us, which is this church. The consequence of running out is emptiness. It's possible that as I mention that word emptiness, it hit home to some of you. It really does hit home to some of you. It's actually familiar to others of you. And let me explain it in more depth. See, emptiness can be a consequence of such things as loss or disappointment or failure or betrayal or heartbreak or separation and on it goes. And for some of you, that has meant embarrassment. It has meant shame. It has actually ruined your reputation because of those things. But it can actually be deeper than those things. 
it can actually feel like part of us has died when we go through that. But church, I've got good news for you today. Is anyone up for some good news today? Come on, you've got to get a little noisy in the house. Is anyone up for some good news today? i got good news that's not just worth hearing. i got good news that actually does something, okay? So let me give you some good news if that's all right. I want to say this to you, that Jesus came to overcome our emptiness. He came, to, he came to this earth to overcome our emptiness, okay? So here it is. Here's the good news from John 10.10 10 in the Amplified Version. It says, the thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. Well, that's the bad news. But the good news, here is, good, here is the good news. I came, now that would be Jesus, that they may have life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Is anyone up for that? Did you hear that, church? To the full till it overflows. Does anyone need that in their life today? Come on, you got to get a little excited because he came for that. He came to fill your life, not just for a half measure, but so that it would overflow. And in our story of the wedding, Jesus demonstrates something really, really important. See, in the ugliness of emptiness, he somehow achieves fullness. See, they, they've run out of wine. So what, what does he do in the moment? What does he do in that moment of emptiness? He starts again. He starts again. And he starts with a simple process. He starts by requesting this. He says, fill the jars with water. It's possible that that some of you standing or sitting here today, you've run out of something. Maybe you're in a season of emptiness. You're drained and you're dry and you're spent. And it feels like you've got absolutely nothing. You're depleted. But can I say that we all have something, church? And you may be thinking, no, Pastor Mick, I've actually got nothing. Right now, I just feel like I've run out of everything. I've run out of hope. I've run out of joy. I've run out of everything. I've got nothing. Can I understand that I understand how you're feeling that way? I get it. I've been there. But I want you to hear me out, church. Please hear me out. Jesus didn't ask those servants at the wedding to bring what they didn't have. He asked those servants at the wedding to bring what they actually had, and that was water. Do you get that? Church, can I say to you that starting again will mean filling. Filling will involve what you already have. Filling will involve what you already possess. Let me show you from Galatians 5. I'm going to get the guys to put it up on the screen. I'm going to ask them to keep it up on the screen because there's something powerful in these words that is going to help you fill those empty places in your life. Let me watch this. It says this in Galatians 5. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Now, produces, it means that we actually have it in us. You have this stuff within you. Upon upon giving your life to Jesus Christ, these things were deposited within you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, And self-control. Have a close look at these qualities. Take a close look at them because they're precious. But not only are they precious, it's what they are what you actually possess. Now, with your current area of emptiness, it's possible that you're not going to be able to bring all of those qualities at once. And I, I get it. You're not going to be able to do that in one hit. But what about one of those qualities? Could you bring some love to your place of emptiness? Could you bring some patience to your place of emptiness? Could you bring some goodness to your place of emptiness? Could you bring some faithfulness to your place of emptiness? Could we do that? Could we bring one thing that would begin to fill this place of emptiness within our lives? What if we kept filling and filling? And filling, and filling. What if we kept doing that? You know what happens? Fullness comes. When we, when we fill, and we fill, and we fill, and we fill, fullness comes. The Bible tells us that. 
as those men filled those water pots. What happened? Fullness came. We see, we see the miracle of the wine, the water becoming wine. The wine is an example of fullness. Who wants fullness in their life? Who wants fullness above emptiness in their life? I want fullness every day of the week. Lord, bring it on. Give me the fullness. And, and fullness came directly after the what? After the filling, didn't it? That's how fullness came. It came as a result of the filling, of the filling. So my question for you and my question for me today, church, is this. Where do we need to start filling? So fullness can come. What about in our marriages? Could we start to fill in that place? What about in our relationships? Could we start to fill in that place? What about in our responsibilities? Could we start to fill in that place? What about in our attitudes? Could we start to fill in that place? Because filling brings fullness and overcomes emptiness. Amen? Church, can I just give you three short suggestions of how to start again? Is that okay? Are you getting something out of this already? Is it, is it working for you? Should I keep going? Praise the Lord. I thought I would. Awesome. Point number one is this. Starting again means coming forward. Now, it's really significant in this story. If you follow this story, and I encourage you to go over it again because it's powerful. It's really significant for us to read in the story that the mother of Jesus came forward. I can imagine that there would be a crowd of people at the wedding. The wine has run out, and they're like, what do we do here? No one would know what to do, but she comes forward. I mean, Jesus did not give her much of a response. He gave her nothing. It's like, Mom, don't bother me. I'm hanging out with the brothers. Mom, don't, don't bother me. I'm hanging out with my boys. But she came forward. She didn't back away. As some of you will know, I, I come from a building background. I'm a carpenter like Jesus. And for many, many years, Wendy and I ran a business and we, we had the most amazing crew of tradesmen. Like it's just God assembled these guys in our world. Like I mean top-notch tradesmen, like quality guys. And, and there was one particular guy that... Um, that was just the standout. He, he was the tradesman of tradesmen. He, he was, he's probably the best carpenter I've ever seen. He's a little older than me and I, I really lent on him and he taught me a lot and he was my right-hand man and we had a good relationship and we built many projects together. And let me just say that something went wrong. It was, let's call it an act of betrayal. And what coincided with that act of betrayal was he decided to leave. He didn't tell me he was going to leave. He just left. He didn't leave real well either. He left badly. But, and he left. And my response was this. My response was to withdraw because he started ringing me again. A couple of weeks went by and he, he started calling me and I didn't pick up the phone because I was upset. I mean, we, we worked together for all these years. He, he, I considered him a friend. I considered him you know, someone I trusted and he, man, I, I was upset and I, I just withdrew totally. I mean, he didn't do right, but I, I didn't make it right. When I had the opportunity to actually make it right, I didn't do it. I just, I just totally shut him out. Many years went by and I didn't see him, but I saw him. And what I mean by that is that I would have cause to drive past his house on occasion. His house is about 20 minutes from my place. And on the way home, I would drive past his house. And on the way home, there was this deep sadness that would, would come into my heart every single time. And, and, and I'd, be, I'd be like, how did we get here? After all those years of working together, all those projects that we, you know, that we, we combined on and we, we put our thoughts together on and we, we worked through, and how, how did we get to this place? There was this, this deeper issue within me of emptiness at the loss of the relationship. I realized that. But it wasn't just sadness. It was deeper than that. It was an emptiness at the loss of a friend, of a loss of someone that had been in my world and an important part of my world. Now, as you know, I, I, I play golf with Pastor Shane. And to keep my job, I let him win. Okay, that's, that's what happens. Now, he might say that he beats me but he's not here to defend this. 
So I want you to know the truth. After all this time, you should know the truth. I let him win. Okay, I have a wife and family to, to provide for, and I need a job. Okay, that's the only reason he wins on the golf course. I'm going to cop it big time. <laughs> he sees this recording, I am finished. Anyway, so it's going to be all good. But we play golf at, at, out at a, a club near, near Melton, and I discover one day that this guy that used to work for me, he also is a member at this club. And I'm like, Lord, what are you trying to do to me here? And I've got to tell you, church, I have seen this guy, but I have done my best to avoid him. And, and I, I, I have done all that I could to avoid him because I did not want to meet this guy again. I didn't want to confront him. I didn't know how it was going to go, but I'm like, it did not end well for us many years ago. But I watched him one day. We, we finished our round and he must have finished just before us. And what happens at the end of a golf game is you have to walk into the shop to present your golf cards and, and, and present your score. So I watched him do it. And on this particular day, Pastor Shane normally does it. He normally takes the, 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 the scorecard in because he wants to gloat about how well he scored and how, how well I didn't. Um, he wants to go in and tell, I must have won this day because he said, you take the cards in. You take them in. And I'm like, on, on any other day, it wouldn't have been a problem. But I saw this guy walk into the shop. And Pastor Shane says, you take the cards in. He has no idea. And I'm thinking, do I watch this guy walk in and then walk out? But I really felt in my heart that I needed to walk in. So I walk in and this guy's there and he sees me, turns around and he sees me and I put my hand out and he looks at me and he looks at my hand and he pauses for a minute. So I'm thinking, how's this going to go? And I keep my hand in the same position and then he, he reaches out and he shakes my hand, which was a pretty special moment. Church, I've got to say to you that that day when I jumped in the car and I drove home, the emptiness left me. It left me. I'd carried that emptiness for years. It left me. I've got to tell you that coming forward caused the emptiness to, to, to be removed from my, my soul and my heart. I've got to tell you, since then, we've, we've been, our relationship has been recovering to the point where we've actually played golf a few times together, which has been awesome. But I've got to tell you, on that day, emptiness became fullness. And my point is this. If we're not coming forward, we're only backing away into emptiness. Church, Jesus did not come to simply give us a second chance, but the opportunity to start again. Amen. <laughs> But it will always mean coming forward and not moving backwards. The second point that I have for you today is this. Starting again means believing Jesus. Now, the mother of Jesus, man, she's a star. She says something that will change the outcome of the wedding. It says this, but his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. And in this instance, the mother of Jesus is demonstrating total confidence in her son, Jesus, who is the son of God. She's not, he's not just her son, but he's the son of God. Now, some of you will have heard of the year 1965. Some of us have lived there. But in 1965, my mum is two months pregnant with myself. And <clears throat> you would normally think that for a couple, that would be a time of celebration. It would be a time, you know, of expectancy. But my, my dad gets a call from the doctors and they ask him to come down to the doctor's surgery. He goes by himself. He doesn't take my mum. And the doctors explain to my dad that uh, there would be fatal or severe consequences for the child. Now, this is largely due to the medication that my mum had been prescribed for her health issues. That meant this, that I would be dead at birth or born without limbs, so born without legs, born without arms. Now, as you can imagine, my dad is devastated. I mean, his world is upside down. And he has at times, you know, when we've talked about this, he's described the emptiness that he felt at hearing this news and, and walking this journey out. And at that time, my dad was, a, was an enthusiastic but very much a new believer. 
My mum was totally unsaved at that time and totally unaware of this situation. My dad chose not to tell her of this situation. He goes to his pastor, a very wise man, and he says, what you need to do is you need to pray. And you need to pray consistently. You need to pray relentlessly. So for the next seven months, he does so. And he prays one day, and, and he hears the, hears the word of God. He hears the voice of God in his heart for the very first time. And, and it goes something like this. Give the child to me. Give the child to me. In other words, God's saying to my dad, I'll take care of it. So my dad is confronted by a decision that all of us will face, church. He believes what the doctors say is true. They're not lying. It's real. But the decision before him was this. Who am I going to believe more? Who am I going to believe more? The doctors or Jesus? So he holds on to what Jesus says, sometimes with his fingertips. It's a rocky seven months. Not letting it go, not letting that word that he heard go. He, he held on to it. All the while reminded of the natural realities that he sees in his pregnant wife. But I've got to tell you, church, that Jesus being believed changed the outcome of that situation. Because as you can see for yourself, I have two legs. They're not, they're not long legs, but they're strong legs. I have two arms. And I got a big mouth. I thank God for praying parents. If you're a parent and you're thinking, what can I do for my kids? Pray for them. Pray for them. They need your prayers. I th I'm alive today because of the faith of my father. I've been protected all of my life because of the, of the faith of my parents, because of praying parents. So I want to say to you parents, if you're like, I'm not, sure what, I'm not sure if I can do anything for my kids. Yes, you can. You can pray for them. Keep praying for them. They need your prayers. They need your prayers. <clears throat> and some of you, church, you've you, you got, you got situations. You've got big stuff going on at the moment. I know it. And their hope, they seem hopeless. It's like there's no hope in some of these situations. They're real and they're overwhelming. But the decision before you is this. Who am I going to believe more? Who am I going to believe more? Because what changes the outcome of our situation is Jesus being believed. Is Jesus being believed as the worship team comes? Let me wrap this up. The last point I have for you is simply this. That starting again means expect best. Expect best. Did you hear that? Now, our story tells us that Jesus produced the best wine. Not just decent wine, not just reasonable wine. He produced the best wine. They're raving about the quality, the best. They're calling it the best. Now, the word best, it's significant. Now, why is that? I, I would suggest that any of us who are in a a situation of emptiness, we'd probably settle for better, wouldn't we? We'd be satisfied with better than we have now, wouldn't we? Even if it was just a little better. Even if it was just marginally better. It'd have to be better than what we've got now. You know, we, if my marriage was a little better, if my finances were a little better, if my situation was just slightly better, That'd be okay. Church, can I encourage you today? Do not settle for better when you have the ability to get the best. When you have access to the best. If you know Jesus Christ, you got access to the best. I actually believe this, church, that we receive what we settle for. If you want the best, who wants the best? You want the best? in those places of emptiness, those places of barrenness, those places of hopelessness. You want the best? Yeah, I want the best. I want the best for you. I want the best for you. Here is the way to receiving best. You cannot settle on better. You must expect best. You must expect best. He went to the cross for each of you, 
willingly so that you would receive best. He didn't go to the cross so that you would get better. He went to the cross and endured that horrible death so that you would get best. Who needs best today? Who needs best today?